Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Friedman, and it is a pleasure to uh, be here at the birth of this, uh, uh, I think, extraordinary new partnership. You know, the Battleground Poll has existed for some time, and we've enjoyed our partnership with the Terrence Group and with Lake uh, Research Partners, represented by the panelists who have just been, two of the panelists who have just been uh, introduced, uh, Ed Goes and uh, Celinda Lake, but it would also, and Jim Vanderhei is the Executive Director of Politico, and it's really this uh, partnership with Politico is the newest element in our development of this very important national resource, the Battleground Poll, and I can't imagine a better time, really, in our nation's history to create a partnership with this kind of strength and promise for the future. You know, we strive as a university and all of our institutional partners represented here strive to be trusted sources of expertise for the public. We try to provide the information that will inform the public so that they can make the kinds of decisions that our nation, uh, our nation really depends on. And I'm very uh, glad to say that in addition to Jim Vanderhei, executive, direct, uh, executive editor rather, of Politico, we also have with us uh, in the audience today our former trustee, the publisher of Politico, and the chairman of, uh, and CEO of Albritton Communications, uh, Robert Albritton is here and uh, a terrific <laughs> partner for us. So with Politico, with the Terrence Group, with Lake Research Partners, uh, we really have an opportunity to extend our commitment to what is really the hallmark of the kind of education we provide here at the George Washington University, which is an education focused on knowledge in action. And this kind of uh, this kind of partnership with the real world of practice that is out there uh, actually uh, forming opinions, leading uh, opinion makers, uh, really thought leaders in our community here in the nation's capital, I think provides a unique window for our students onto uh, the way politics operate and really makes good on our promise to provide a front row at the seat of history. So thank you all for being with us today. We're all looking forward eager eagerly to these first fruits of our new partnership as we explore the results of this latest round of the Battleground Poll in partnership with Politico. Thanks very much and please enjoy the presentations. Thank you, President Am. GW has been a proud partner in the Battleground Pool since 2004. Our Gelman Library, under the direction of Jack Siggins, who is with us this morning, is now home to the entire archive of the poll dating back two decades, providing access to researchers, students, and journalists around the world. As some of you may know, on this very stage, Democrats and Republicans engaged in nearly 800 spirited debates during our campus run of CNN Crossfire. Today, on the same stage, and in the same positive bipartisan spirit, we launch a new chapter for the Battleground Poll by welcoming America's premier political news source, Politico, to the partnership. I'd like to acknowledge one person who was in the audience uh, also who was pivotal to this process, the Chief Operating Officer of Politico, Kim Kingsley. Kim, could you just uh, stand up? Yeah, thank you. As President Knapp mentioned, at today's event, we'll present the first of three analyses of new polls to be conducted prior to the November congressional elections. The partnership will also produce three additional polls in 2011. To get the ball rolling this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce the person who has led GW's substantive contributions to the battleground poll for the past six years, my colleague, friend, and partner in this project, GW Professor of Political Management, Christopher Arterton. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me know, is my microphone working? I can hear. Good. Um, well, I wanted to just quickly uh, say, uh, go over some of the benefits to the university. Not only do we have the research archives uh, at Gelman, but uh, this poll is used in many of our classes, uh, not just the headline notes, but uh, the ability to go in and do some detailed demographics analysis of how public opinion is shaping the climate of politics. Uh, and from time to time, uh, GW professors have an opportunity to add questions in to this uh, for their own uh, research. 
This morning, we're going to hear a lot about the dynamics of the 2010 elections. For obvious reasons, that remains a uh, focus uh, and uh, a matter that is uh, available in many public opinion polls today. Uh, but here, we're bold enough to take an early peek at the 2012 election, uh, to look at the sources of political information, uh, and at the public's view of some prominent political leaders. So those will also be uh, discussed here this morning. My role is primarily to introduce my new colleague, uh, Jim Vandehei, uh, and who will co-moderate this with me, and then he will introduce my long-standing colleagues. Uh, as you've already heard, uh, Jim Vandehei is the executive editor and co-founder of Politico. It's extremely uh, interesting in this era when many news organizations are having trouble to be partnering with a news organization that is in the ascendancy uh, and gaining strength. Uh, thanks in many ways to the uh, leadership of Jim Vandehei, John Harris, uh, and uh, Robert Albritton. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Van de Hey was uh, uh, list Van de Hey, sorry, was listed by Vanity Fair as uh, among the most hundred powerful information age thinkers and a model for the new new media success story. He has spent a lot of time uh, commenting. He's a frequent commentator on uh, Morning Joe. Uh, on MSNBC, and that means that he actually should be down on the mall running a 3K right now. Um, <clears throat> but we've uh, been able to entice him up here uh, above the, the mall. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, uh, in 1994, and then quickly moved uh, to Washington, where he's had a 15-year career uh, in uh, politics, working for Roll Call, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. My great pleasure to welcome you. you to this partnership. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this is great. This is a real thrill uh, for Politico. Uh, we want to thank uh, President Knapp uh, and Mike Friedman and Chris. Uh, we talked about, we've probably had dozens of partnerships uh, with companies big and small since we launched Politico. Uh, and I can say with total sincerity that we've never had one that has been smoother and easier to execute than this one. We had a couple of meetings where I actually joked with Mike, I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's got to be at least one tension point in putting this thing together because we're brawling with everybody. And there never was. So I think that's a testament uh, to Mike, to your team, and to the folks uh, behind the scenes because there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into this. Uh, Sarah D'Angelo uh, at Politico on our team was instrumental in pulling this together. A ton of folks uh, under Mike's leadership at uh, GW that really did a ton to, to pull this thing together and to make sure that it'll be a success. And we're thrilled because there's, uh, to me, there's a lot of flimsy polling out there and it's tough for people to figure out, can you trust this poll, can you not trust this poll? And we're here today with two of the best uh, on the Republican side and the Democratic side who put the money, the resources, and the thought into polling that it takes to really, I think, get a good snapshot of where the public is. So uh, I think it's, uh, we're thrilled, we're excited uh, about the poll, and we're excited uh, today to hear from uh, Celinda Lake first, and then Ed Goaz, uh, the Republican pollster, and they're gonna give an analysis, they're gonna talk about their interpretation of the poll. Uh, it might even be partisan on one side or the other, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, and then uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a debate and, and a discussion about uh, what's happening with this poll, what's happening in this uh, fascinating election. So Celinda's gonna go first, so thank you. Thank you very much. And I really wanna thank, um, first of all, I wanna thank GW because um, this has just been a tremendous partnership for the battleground, uh, starting with the Dean and um, Chris, and now with Mike Friedman uh, from the get-go, uh, and really very a very rich partnership. It's also wonderful to be with Politico because uh, all of my friends read Politico first. So uh, uh, you have I, such smart friends. <laughs> we do have smart friends, uh, depressed smart friends right now, but very smart <laughs> friends. So I, it's a very very exciting uh, new iteration for us, and obviously. Um, there's, uh, there's nothing that I can say that would be, be good enough in terms of how I feel about it. Go as both as a personal friend and as a political colleague and as a very, very smart strategist. I always think, oh darn, when I'm up against him. So it's a wonderful partnership. One of the things I want to say about the battleground, and we've been doing this 
now uh, for almost 20 years is that uh, the battleground doesn't attempt to mush things together and find a common analysis. What we do is, uh, that is unique and uh, still remains unique, is take the same data set and analyze it from each of our perspectives. And that has been a very rich intellectual partnership for us, I think, rich for the students and observers who are part of it, and a very, very unique voice uh, in terms of analysis. I also think that the article that Politico wrote was one of the best that I've seen on polling, and so really a credit to the, the writers of that, and it's a whole new depth. So uh, the two things I would say is that uh, in terms of, from the Democratic perspective of this data, uh, the week's primaries demonstrate once uh, again that conventional wisdom is uh, often wrong and that beltway wisdom is really usually wrong. Um, and the polls show similarly that the mounting rhetoric uh, that there is the demise of the Democratic Party is premature. It is a volatile and challenging environment for both parties out there. And believe it or not, and it may seem hard to imagine that there's a poll with some good news for Democrats, uh, but there is a poll that has uh, some good news for Democrats and a real pathway in a very tough environment. Let me say five basic points from the Democratic perspective in terms of how we see the data. First of all, the generic ballot is tied. Uh, now, this is with a conservative turnout model. Um, but, uh, and we'll talk a lot, both of us will talk about the enthusiasm gap, which is a very, very important factor that the Democrats have to deal with. But we start out with a tied generic ballot. Obviously, the Republicans pull up anywhere from six uh, to eight, nine points, uh, depending on what happens with the turnout. And turnout is clearly the number one issue uh, out there for Democrats right now. But to start even is um, significantly better than most uh, prognosticators are pointing us out. Um, the good news is that Democrats also get to run against Republicans, and uh, the Republican Party isn't in any better shape than we are, um, and seems to be in even more disarray if you look at the primary results. Um, the Republicans in Congress have even lower approval rates than the Democrats in Congress. Neither side has very good ratings, and neither congressional party has very popular leadership externally, although I would say that the job of congressional leaders is more internal than external. But the point is, we don't just run against a vacuum. We run against Republicans, and that still leaves this open to victories. Uh, this poll really shows, boy, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog, uh, to quote the president, uh, ex-president. But I will say this, that the president and the vice president are the only two Washington national leaders who are net positive with the public. Um, and so much has been made of uh, disapproval of the president's job, et cetera. But the point of the matter is people still personally like him and personally approve of him. And that gives him a platform for engaging uh, the public. And that platform is going to be very important in the next six weeks, both in terms of mobilizing the voters and Democrats love the president and the vice president, and also for articulating our case on the economy. And finally, uh, this data shows that the Democrats have a compelling argument to make on the number one issue that is out there, uh, jobs and the economy. Uh, we're even on jobs and the economy, which given uh, the bashing that the economic policies have taken is still, I think, good news, although more sobering than we have been in the past. And um, secondly, when we asked people, one of the most important questions, I think, was we asked people who would they blame uh, for the current economic situation. And the number one person that they blamed was George Bush uh, for the state of the national economy. This doesn't mean that our party should look backward. And in fact, I think that would be a huge mistake. Um, voters don't want to hear a critique. They want to know what we're going to do about this situation. But the point of the matter is uh, that voters blame number one uh, George Bush, not Barack Obama. In fact, Barack Obama is fourth. They blame financial institutions. They blame the global economy. And a small proportion of the voters uh, blame Barack Obama for this economy. If we look at independents and undecided voters in the congressional race, and they are an ordinary lot. Uh, they are mad at both parties. Uh, but if we look at those voters, um, they are particularly angry at financial institutions. Uh, financial institutions who are the allies of the, of the Republican Party, financial institutions uh, who the Democrats took on to pass Wall Street reform with uh, virtually no help from uh, the Republicans. So it is a tough battleground out there, but it is a battleground um, still. 
and the economy still offers Democrats some opportunities. Let me amplify a couple of numbers. Uh, first of all, um, the voters uh, do think the country is going in the wrong direction. It is clearly a mood for change out there. Uh, but not all change is good in voters' minds. And I don't think anybody who runs on either party as a status quo candidate is going to find themselves defeated if they weren't already defeated in their primaries. Um, but having said that, there is still a choice to be made around which vision of change you want. And that is a much, much more competitive battleground. The economy overwhelmingly uh, dominating uh, the electorate, and it has steadily risen. Uh, one of the things that I think Democrats are fully aware of is that voters wonder, if you think this economy is better, they wonder what planet you just visited from. The best way to find an indicator of a Martian who has moved here is if you find someone who says the economy is in good shape. Uh, they are either completely insane or they are Martian because no real American thinks the economy is in good shape here. That said, as I mentioned, uh, there is plenty of room for Democrats to articulate their vision. And there's also lots of room in these localized congressional contexts for candidates to talk about what they personally have done in these very difficult times to fight for their seniors, to bring local jobs, uh, to turn back uh, a pay raise because they're in touch with their district and understanding, um, not running on the stimulus package, and I'm sure Ed will talk a lot about that, but running instead on our vision of economics and what we've done and populist economics. Barack Obama is a very complex president, and the voters' views of him are very complex. But there are two pieces of good news in here for Democrats. One is he has 65% approval rating, uh, which is a personal approval rating. Uh, now, we learned in the early days uh, of the Clinton administration that people made this distinction, and the battleground was actually, at Ed's instigation, the first poll to really distinguish these two dimensions, the personal and the job performance dimension. And 65% of the voters approving personally of the president. Uh, in addition, you have 90% of Democrats who like Barack Obama and 77% of Democrats who like Joe Biden. This is a powerful team uh, to go mobilize the Democratic base. And you've seen them go on the road already. Uh, I hope that they gave the president a one-way ticket and he doesn't come back until the elections because uh, he can have enormous influence out there laying out our economic plan and also energizing Democrats. And that's going to be a very, very important part of the equation. In terms of the images of the two parties, as I mentioned, 25% um, of the voters approve of the job Congress has done, 64% uh, disapprove. No one, I think, will be running defending Congress. Uh, but having said that, um, as I mentioned, uh, both parties viewed net negatively, uh, but the Democrats viewed more positively than the Republicans. Uh, neither is uh, going home with great shakes, but neither party has identified themselves in a way that's positive. And people uh, not knowing the Republican leadership, but those few who do not rating them positively. Democrats, even on the economy, uh, even uh, within two points, even on creating jobs, even on sharing your values, there's still a powerful economic dialogue uh, to be had out there. The patterns of the vote are pretty similar to what you would have expected. The same regional patterns, racial patterns, marital patterns, um, gender gap that you expect, uh, and, but close. Um, you know, Democrats are not getting routed from men. Uh, for example, as they have been in past elections where we did get slaughtered. And women are supporting uh, Democrats uh, by 14 points. Uh, the gender gap, a very, very important piece of the equation here. Younger voters are the most Democratic voters. Seniors remain the toughest force. And if there is a storyline in this election that is slightly different than the past, it is the animosity of seniors who will show up to vote. All of this makes GOTV the most important thing that can happen. And if you look at the extremely likely voters, Republicans are ahead by six points. There is an enthusiasm gap, but that gap is narrowing. Uh, some of the better news in this poll is that uh, while we saw the biggest uh, enthusiasm gap we had ever seen, significantly bigger than 1994 in the previous battleground, in this one we're starting to see it narrow. And even though Democrats are behind, it's now a situation where I think there's some possibility of elevating uh, the Democratic turnout 
uh, organizationally and with our leadership uh, to rival that of the Republicans. So what's the bottom line? Uh, it's a tough, tough environment out there for both parties, and both parties are going to find some surprises on November. Uh, this electorate is relishing uh, upsetting the status quo, and uh, neither party resting on their laurels. Democrats have two jobs out there. Get our base uh, in, more enthusiastic and turn out to vote and articulate clearly uh, our economic plans for the future. Not writing on the past, but understanding that voters still blame the Republicans and their allies more for the state of the economy uh, than Democrats. That's going to take a lot of work and a lot of money. And um, it'll be an interesting election season at best. And glad to be with Politico and GW uh, monitoring those results. Let me turn it over to Ed. The other half of the story. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me also say I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today with the new partnership, or the expanded partnership, I might say. Uh, but I, I do want to focus a little bit on Salunda. There's not enough good that I can say about Salunda. Um, uh, she used to, in the bad years uh, for Republicans, uh, I heard her, overheard her once. I don't think she heard me talk. Her, she knew I was listening saying, you know, I worry the most with Ed when I get him down uh, in terms of the numbers because I know he just pulls the pin on the hand grenade and throws it. Um, uh, actually, I think the opposite of Celinda is that when the numbers are bad for Celinda, she has the creativity to kind of dig down deep and to really find uh, a pass out. Um, uh, I think very often uh, I find the pollsters out there kind of playing the top line data as opposed to the bottom line data and, and she is consistently honest uh, to the profession and honest to her candidates and campaigns uh, to really dig down deep for what is there. I, I do have to say I feel like I'm kind of watching myself four years ago uh, <laughs> uh, listening to Celinda's uh, presentation. Um, uh, 2006 was an election cycle that um, not only was it rough in terms of the numbers that were there, what we were finding uh, is that no matter what we said or did, nothing was working. Yeah. Um, and that is what I'm seeing in large part for the Democratic campaigns in this election cycle. Nothing is working. It's not that they're not smart. It's not that they can't dig down deep. It's just the, 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 the environment is so tilted uh, against them uh, that is a very, very tough race. I think Celinda has kind of dug out some of the better data um, some of it I will refute uh, in, in the next few minutes here. Um, but uh, I do want to take a little bit of a step back and kind of look at this environment. Um, yes, uh, we've seen the, the intensity abate a little bit from where we saw it in the spring. However, you know, to give you a comparative um, uh, analysis of where we were in 1994, 1994 we saw a Republican intensity six points higher than the Democrats. Spring this year, we saw it 14 points higher. It was over double what we had seen. In this data, we see Republican in intensity eight points higher. Um, uh, so it has come down some. We saw it coming down some uh, really during the summer. Um, but um, uh, if you look at 1994, it actually had abated some as you went into the fall campaign. I think we were running about four uh, points. So we're still looking at almost double the intensity that we saw uh, in the election. The one thing we do know after now 20 years of watching year in and year out off year elections, um, there, there are really three factors that we look at. Number one, it's a different electorate. Um, uh, in a presidential year, about 70% of registered voters vote. Uh, in fact, one of the, um, I, I think, myths of the 2008 campaign is 2008 only turned out two-tenths of a percent higher turnout than four years earlier, as opposed to this kind of feeling that there was this massive new electorate that came out and voted and higher participation. It wasn't higher at all. Uh, there were some groups in some states uh, that was higher. There were some groups in some states that were lower. Uh, but the net result overall was that the turnout was basically in that same standard we have seen uh, percentage-wise ever since the 18-year-olds got the right to vote in that 70% range of registered voters. More importantly, there's even less flexibility in the, in the non-presidential years. It really comes in about that 50% of turnout. There are two factors then that come into play. One is intensity of the party, which is why we watch it so closely. 
um, because the nuances of going down to 50 percent, uh, independent vote drops from about 36, 37 percent of the votes cast down to about 26, 27 percent as a piece of the pie of votes cast. So the, the intensity of the party, it's a larger <coughs> piece of the pie in terms of who turns out. Um, and so that intensity becomes a major factor. On the independence, the other factor we look at is, is, is the independent vote. Uh, because it's angry independents who turn out. That is kind of the wild card in a, in a non-presidential year. Um, uh, where with Republicans and Democrats, it's the margin of intensity. With independents, very often, it's a different group of independents that vote from four years earlier. Obviously, the independents that were angry at the White House, angry at Republicans four years ago, are not the angry independents of this election cycle, which is angry at the White House again and angry at the Democrats. And so you see a much different factor. And we saw that in New Jersey last year, in Virginia last year, in Massachusetts <coughs> this year. The, the, the numbers overall changed dramatically on election day. In all three of those races, a two to one margin of independents voted for the Republican. <coughs> so we watched that very closely. Um, both of those factors very much in the, in, in the Republican favor. Looking at the overall numbers, uh, uh, kind of projecting to seven weeks from now, um, we do watch the generic ballot. Now, again, a caveat as we as pollsters uh, uh, look at on the generic ballot, the national generic ballot is never seen as a predictor of what's going to happen with Congress. There is a net advantage to the Democrats in terms of generic ballot on the overall numbers in that there are 73, 75 minority districts in this country um, that are somewhere around the range of, of 80 to 10 Democrat to Republican. Um, if you factor those out of the national average, uh, Michael Barone, I think, has been one of those that have dug the deepest on this. He thinks between a three to five point advantage for the Democrats is a dead even nationally in terms of Congress. In fact, in 1994, the last survey that we conducted uh, going into the election showed, in fact, Republicans three points down. Uh, and we saw that as an indicator that we were looking at a fairly <coughs> even race uh, going into it. More importantly, the intensity factor, that 43-43 tie on the generic vote, in the, if you do a model in terms of taking into account intensity and who's going to participate in this election cycle, moves to an eight-point advantage for Republicans. It moves very, very quickly to a Republican advantage uh, because of that environment. So that is one of the things that we're looking at. The other is obviously the president's job approval rating. Um, uh, it is very instructive that when uh, the president's job approval rating is over 60 percent, the net loss or gain for the party in power of the White House has been plus one congressional seats. If the, if the president's job approval is over 50 percent, the average loss for the incumbent party in the White House is 12 seats, lost. If the president's job approval is below 50 percent, the average net loss for the party in power is 41 seats. And we're looking at 39 seats needed for control of Congress. So that's where you do have this kind of feel of is not just where the president's job approval rating is, it, where is it in terms of a majority, overwhelming majority, or uh, a plurality. In this case, he has a plurality that negative. Strongly approved or strongly disapproved for the president's job approval is 27%. Strongly approved, 38% strongly disapproved. And that's where you see the angry independents come into play. Probably the biggest factor that we see in terms of this data is really two things. One is uh, we know as political pollsters that it basically takes six solid months of good economic news for the mentality, the economic mentality of the American populace to turn from a recession mentality to a, uh, a growth mentality, if you will. Uh, that's when you see concerns over unemployment and jobs drop. Once there is a strong perception that we are in a recovery, then all of a sudden voters say, well, I didn't lose my job. I still feel bad about the person that has lost theirs, but now let's focus on other issues. Um, the voters aren't there, uh, and they're not going to change uh, in, in, in the next uh, uh, seven weeks. Uh, that story is over. Um, this election cycle will be run as a recession attitude, recession mentality, in terms of the voters that are out there. 
Um, and I think one of the things the Democrats keep trying to grab onto is who's to blame. Um, when in fact where I see the voters is the voters are very much focused on we don't like the solutions that are there, we don't think they're working. Uh, in fact, when we asked a question about uh, the stimulus by 38 to, to 54, voters are saying the stimulus isn't working. Now, you may ask, why is the president, and um, almost every presidential visit to the states that he's taking right now, the key issue, the core of what he's talking about is the stimulus package. That is because, and I think it's a very simple factor, that if, in fact, this election becomes a a referendum on whether or not the stimulus worked, you have just taken away the last leg of, of the Obama uh, economic plan. That is the core and the central part of his economic recovery. So he has to keep going out there. He has to keep fighting on that issue uh, to make sure this doesn't become a referendum uh, on, on, the, uh, on his solution uh, of the stimulus. Uh, the key thing I see in the survey is really two things. One is, um, and, and I've always been one to discount the are you favorable, unfavorable towards Republicans and Democrats in Congress. I mean, the bottom line, if you look internally in the numbers, and I've always rejected the Republicans that we're talking about, we need to rebrand the party. Um, if you look at the internal data, Republicans, when you ask about the national congressional Republicans, are always negative. They're not only negative now, they're not only negative when they were doing bad things four years ago, they were negative 20 years ago. Um, that is just the nuance of Republicans. Democrats, when the Democrats are in control, very supportive of their Democrat congressmen. Republicans, never. Um, so <laughs> you, 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 you always have this kind of nuance where Republicans are always seen in a worse light when you ask that question. The bigger thing we see is that when you look at issue after issue after issue, Republicans have an advantage. We now have an advantage of two points on, on economic recovery or economic growth. We are even for the first time in 20 years of doing the battleground on who will do a better job of jobs. We're always down. There is a nuance towards the Democrats. We're always down on that issue, and we're even in the survey. If you look at taxes, up by 27 points. Uh, spending uh, and wasteful spending, up by 14 points on handling that issue. The deficit, 17 points. And one of the things that, and this is projecting past this election cycle, one of the things we have seen under the surface is that spending has come roaring up as the number two issue. In fact, in states where unemployment is 8% or less, as opposed to 8% or more, spending is now the number one issue in those states. And what we know is that sometime the econ economy is going to recover. It may be the next six months, the next year, but at some point this economy is going to recover. Spending is going to become, come roaring in as the number one issue, and is always followed by taxes. So where very often the Democrats are fond of saying, we have a huge lead on jobs, we have a huge lead on the economy, these are our issues. We have now neutralized those issues and just laying there in wait is a huge advantage for Republicans and I think that's gonna be a key issue uh, going into the presidential election next time. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention in my remarks is we did ask some name ID questions on the legislative leaders. Um, one of the things, and we actually do uh, 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 Leader Boehner's work uh, in Congress have ever since he first came to Congress. And one of the things I've always said to him on the side is you need to understand that history is higher name ID for a legislative leader is never a good thing. Um, it is always the people that are angry at you as opposed to the people that like what you're doing. It's kind of one of the nuances of the job. Right now, uh, Leader Boehner and, and Senator McConnell are fairly close in terms of their favorable, unfavorable. 16% on both favorable, 20 and 21%, 20% uh, 20 for Senator McConnell, 21% uh, uh, for uh, uh, Leader Boehner uh, in terms of unfavorable. So they're basically at a one-to-one -one ratio. Senator Reid, not nearly as well known as the rest of the country, as, as the speaker, is at 19% favorable, 37% unfavorable. Uh, so he is basically at a two to one margin. And the speaker, after all the kind of talk when she first came in about how favorable she was being viewed, is now at a 31 to 52. 
Now, one of the big questions, I think, in terms of this campaign, and we're in uh, uh, dozens of campaigns across the country, is we are watching the impact of the president. When the president comes in, we are seeing approximately a three-point bump, uh, mainly because he's getting a seven- or eight-point bump in terms of Democrats, the loyalty of Democrats voting for that local Democratic candidate, whether it's Congress, Senator, or Governor, is popping up. It's popping up for a period of about a week. The more interesting thing, though, is that what he's not popping when he comes up is the intensity. And so if you're increasing the Democrat support level, but you're not increasing the intensity <coughs> to vote, it has very, very limited impact. Um, one of the big question marks, and I'm going to throw this out for the press, that will be very interesting to watch is that the president, in fact, is not helping the candidates out there as he goes out there campaigning. He, in fact, is helping from a fundraising standpoint. He is helping in terms of raising the loyalty sum, but he's not having an impact on this intensity factor or having any impact on the angry independence. If anything, he's making it a little bit worse. I believe you're going to be, begin seeing uh, the president <coughs> focus his attention in terms of where he's traveling, not on where his help is needed the most and would be most helpful, but in fact, watch the presidential target states. Watch Florida, watch Ohio, watch Missouri, uh, watch Iowa, watch New Mexico. Uh, those are the states I think you're going to see him going uh, going to, because quite frankly, right now, both the Senate candidate and the gubernatorial candidate in Ohio has a fairly large lead. That is not good news for Obama, not for this year, but is not good for uh, good news for the president in any re-election uh, in, a, in a key state. So I would watch for that. Last point I would make is questions I keep being asked is why the shift all of a sudden to focusing on going after Speaker Boehner. Um, if I were Democrats, I'd be somewhat concerned about this because I... Did you say Speaker Boehner? <laughs> Speaker Boehner. Well, that, my, that's my point. I think they, in fact, are acknowledging that they think that's what's going to happen. That this is the beginning. This is not about this election. This is not about the tax issue. This is not about what's going to happen now. It's about beginning the demonization process of November, December, January, so that when, in fact, Congress comes back in, and if, in fact, as many people believe, it will be Speaker Boehner, um, that they are beginning that demonization process to start raising that name ID in a negative way. And it, again, a very interesting thing to kind of watch in terms of maneuvers, not necessarily having an impact on this election, but very much on down the road. So I'll leave it there. Excellent. Well, uh, well good. Uh, let's. Uh, dig into some of this stuff. I guess uh, two questions I have for both of you. One would be, when you dig through this, either the top line numbers or the cross tabs, what number worries you the most for your party? And I'd like both of you to take a crack at that. Mm -hmm. And also, I think most people in the audience and most people watching probably don't have the same screw loose that we do where we pour through all of these numbers <laughs> and they probably don't have time to. What is the one number that people should pay attention to as the most reliable indicator of what will happen uh, in November? Mm -hmm. Well, the number that I worry about the most is the uh, number of the enthusiasm of the Democrats. Um, that's the number that we most have to change if we want to change uh, the election. And, you know, the number is improving and the gap is closing, but as both of us said, uh, you've got 65 percent of Democrats enthusiastic. That's better than it was. You have some constituencies like unmarried women and African Americans who have even lower enthusiasm. So, and younger voters who really look like they're not going to show up to vote. So we got to get that turned around. Uh, in terms of the number that um, I think is most predictive, other than the obvious ones of, of the generic vote itself and the enthusiasm, uh, perhaps uh, who's better on the economy? Uh, we need, in the next six weeks, I agree that we can't turn around the numbers on the stimulus. We need to pick up a couple point advantage on that. Who's going to be better at creating jobs? Who's going to be better on the economy? I don't think you can expect Democrats to be sent back if they're not thought to be good on the economy. Uh, the one number I didn't mention that we watch, and more because I watch it as opposed to like to explain what is there, is the issue of who shares your values. That is kind of at a gut level. Uh, one of the things I have felt very strongly in, in our campaigns on the Republican side this year is that this has been an election about connecting with voters as opposed to convincing voters. Um, they're already angry. They already believe that solutions are not working. 
uh, what we had some repair work to do was on the issue of uh, uh, connecting with the voters. Uh, and for the first time, quite frankly, in four years, and the numbers got very, very bad at the tail end of the 2008 campaign for Republicans. I think we were down like 13 or 14 points on that measurement. We're back to even on that measurement also uh, for the first time in, 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 in quite a while. So that's one measurement that I watch very closely, but that's not going to be really available to a lot of people out there. Um, I think the the bigger, rather than specific issues, the bigger thing that, that kind of thinking ahead that I watch is what are the perceptions for, for next time around. It is very interesting that for very often in campaigns uh, you have this kind of focus on concern for the next generation, concern for our children and our grandchildren. You hear it in the rhetoric at campaigns a lot. What we're hearing from the bottom up is concern for the future for the country. I mean, there truly is a growing um, a movement out there way beyond the Tea Party, a growing movement out there of concern about the direction that this country is going, about the solutions that are being implemented. Um, and my biggest concern, when I look at this data, and you have, by a nine, eight, nine point margin, uh, voters believing Republicans are going to take control of the House, believing we'll take control of the Senate, both. Um, we know from the data that we'll probably be over 30 governor's seats. We'll probably win 400 legislative seats uh, nationwide, all in the mix. Uh, if, if, if the perception is they're being elected to stop these bad things from happening, uh, which would be a realistic perception, uh, that's fine. But if the perception is we're going to turn around <coughs> some of the things that have happened uh, and change the direction, that will be very difficult without also having the White House. And so uh, this could be a very short-lived positive time for Republicans if, in fact, that perception is we're going to be able to undo some of these wrongs that the voters perceive have been done uh, in the last two years. Chris? Well, uh, Celinda, I, wanna, I know you're very concerned about the gender gap. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us uh, what is happening there in terms of intensity and probability of turnout and, um, and how that fares for the Democrats? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Chris, and great question. So first of all, uh, just to remember that 53% of the electorate is female. And so our goal as Democrats is to uh, create enthusiasm among women and keep men uh, sullen but not mutinous, as I put it. Um, so right now, we're even in part because uh, by 14 points, women are supporting the Democrats, and by 15 points, um, men are supporting the Republicans. And that puts it dead even, given the, the advantages. Um, that is a very big gender gap, by the way. That is a historic proportion gender gap. Um, we also see in the data a very, very strong um, marital gap as well. And uh, one of the untold stories here is that uh, often the marital gap uh, rivals uh, the gender gap in that married voters vote uh, Republican, unmarried voters vote Democratic. And you see um, a, uh, a gender gap, uh, a marital gap as well. Key in that is the turnout of unmarried women voters. Uh, we have now half of households in America that are unmarried. Now, not half of voters are unmarried because unmarrieds turn out at so much lower rate uh, than married voters. Uh, but one of the keys in terms of the gender gap will be that turnout ratio of unmarried voters, unmarried men and women voting Democratic, but unmarried women, one of the most Democratic, uh, loyal Democratic constituencies. Last point I'll make very quickly is that um, Unmarried women, uh, this has not been a particularly good year for Democratic women candidates. It has been actually a bumper year for Republican women candidates, and uh, at both ones they were expecting and ones they weren't. Um, <laughs> at, but uh, interestingly, unmarried women are some of the most supportive women candidates, uh, and that includes Democratic and Republican women candidates, but particularly Democratic women candidates. So their turnout. Uh, and you now have an, a historic number of races with women in them, particularly Republican women, and a historic number of women-women races. Uh, that turnout of those unmarried women is going to make a big difference. So we have the gender gap is alive and well. It is, uh, of the, the structure of it is such that it can be an advantage for um, 
the, Republican, the Democrats, but only if the Democrats turn out to vote. Last point, 60% of the undecided voters right now are female. So as is typical, uh, we are coming down to who can convince, it's up to the women, and who can convince uh, blue collar, older blue collar women, independent women, uh, to be on their side is who's going to win this election. And, and oh, you wanted to respond? Well, I, I, I would just add a couple of things. And it, the, the one kind of glaring number that jumps out is if you look at, at, at married voters compared to single voters, married voters has a 14-point higher intensity level at this point. So all the kind of surface numbers look very good, but as Salone is exactly right on talking about, uh, the, the big question mark there is, is that going to be evened out some from, from turnout uh, because of the intensity problem that is there. The, the one thing I would point to, there's, there's two very interesting races. Uh, there's only been one time in history for governor that there's been two women running against each other, and that was in Kansas, I believe, back in the 1980s uh, when a Republican uh, candidate named Kay Orr won. Um, this year you have two states. One is New Mexico, one is Oklahoma, where you have women running against each other, both of which have Democrat incumbent governors leaving mm -hmm. uh, after eight years in office. In both those races, currently, the Republican candidate is leading by double digits um, uh, in those two gubernatorial races. So very, very interesting races. I think it's going to tighten uh, in both those races. But uh, when you start talking about the gender gap, one of the most interesting ways to look at how it plays out is look at those places where you have two women running against each other. So I, I wanted to ask Ed, um, Ed to focus on uh, the sort of climactic elections, uh, 80, 94, 08. All of those seem to me to be characterized by voting against um, in addition to, or as a major factor, voting against uh, this. And that seems to be what we're headed into uh, in 2010. And I wonder if this is an inherent characteristic of the American voter, that they are uh, uh, energized by what they don't like more than by what they do like? Well, uh, that's always a factor. Uh, in, in, and again, particularly you named some presidential years, but is always a factor in a non-presidential year that you have the angry independence and you have the intensity of the base. There is a basic tendency of the American public, and you've heard me say this before, that it's easier to scream with alarm than point with pride. Um, and so very often the out party uh, is, is always more intense because they're focusing on those things that are scaring them uh, as opposed to those things that people are being prideful of. Uh, I would also say I, I, I notice a trend, um, and I think it's becoming more and more and more so. Um, uh, I saw it, and not to be overly critical of the Bush White House, but I did see some tendencies of this, uh, whether you want to call it hubris or, or whatever, um, that they basically hammered out a victory uh, in, in 2000. Uh, uh, more importantly, in 2004, with having a bigger campaign than the other side. Um, clearly what you had in, in 2008 was a campaign that the environment was strongly tilted in the direction of the Democrats. I think there was no question um, uh, that a Democrat was a leg up plus some uh, in terms of the election. Um, but you see he also ran a $700 million campaign. And sometimes I see the kind of attitude of the White House afterwards that they don't say, well, I built in a good environment for us a bigger campaign, but they kind of walk away from the campaign saying, I'm smarter than the other side and everyone in the country agrees with me. <laughs> and I think that is the beginning of the end uh, for, for good numbers for a, for, a, for a White House because, in fact, uh, the last campaign was not about the entire country agreeing with them. And quite frankly, it wasn't about they were a lot smarter than the other side. Um, and in fact, when they tried to message, and all of a sudden they don't have the air cover of the $700 million, making sure not only do they get the message out there, but they have everyone hear it exactly the way they want it to be, um, uh, they, they make some real mistakes. And I think there has been some messaging mistakes here. Um, if I would say anything has been a mistake with, with this White House, is they have stuck way too long on the issue of who's at fault because the American public has moved past that. They are very definitely focused on who's making things better for us and who isn't making things better for us. When you look at the, uh, getting back to the enthusiasm gap, mm -hmm. and I mean, I found some very striking, especially with younger voters, right. African-American voters, uh, 
unmarried women. I don't know if you can get this from the polling data, but I'd be curious for, for your take on this. I mean, President Obama essentially has done the bulk of what he promised liberals that he would do in office, pass the health care bill, increased spending, is currently fighting to, to push back on the Bush tax cuts for the rich. Yet there's a sense, certainly in Washington, in the activist community, of frustration with Obama. And I think you start to see it in those numbers. How do you explain that? How could, how could, how could these core groups that helped elect him be so excited about him Then he does what they were excited about him doing, then he does it and they don't like him, or they're not uh -huh. enthused about him. Explain that, and I don't know. If you can um, well, I think it's a very, in, I think it's a very <clears throat> complex and interesting question, and I think it's a really good question to look at this poll on because I think a lot of the conventional wisdom is wrong on it. First of all, if you look at liberal Democrats in the survey, <coughs> they like um, Barack Obama better than conservative Democrats do. So, uh, this disaffection of the left, I think, is is exaggerated. I would say. As we look at these plans, there is a lot uh, that is uh, that we're, a lot of places where the progressives have had, have had to compromise. I mean, we haven't had the tough energy uh, that plans that we wanted. Uh, the um, the healthcare plan does not have a public option, which is was not just a a token or, or something like that. I mean, it, it was fundamental to uh, how progressives believe health care reform costs will really come down. Um, and there are a number of other things. Uh, you know, we still don't have the Fair Pay Act uh, passed. Now, that frustration isn't just with the president. That frustration is sometimes uh, with the Senate <laughs> in particular, because I think the Speaker's been very, very aggressive about getting it. We don't have uh, cap and trade legislation, <coughs> global warming legislation. So there's a lot where the left has compromised. There's a lot where the left has um, not gotten uh, what, there's a lot that the House has passed that the Senate is still sitting on, and I, it's going to be ironic that the House will probably pay the price for it. Having said that, though, if you look at this data, I think the question is not that these constituencies, African Americans, Latinos, unmarried women, young people, are um, unhappy with the legislation that has been passed, I think they are unhappy with the results of that legislation. And so uh, these are some of the hardest hit groups economically. Uh, you're going to see new poverty numbers come out today with a record jump uh, in the poverty level. And you're going to see African Americans, Latinos, young people, and unmarried women hit disproportionately hard. So this economy has been particularly hard on the Democratic base. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is that uh, as uh, in the next six weeks, I think the president, the administration, every member of Congress needs to communicate to energize this base. Uh, we get it. We're in touch. We know exactly uh, what is happening here. And here's what we plan to do about it. It's reminiscent for me of uh, 1993, where we did focus groups for then President Clinton. And he was frustrated about why he wasn't getting more credit for his economic plan. And we did focus groups in this wonderful woman in Southeast LA. We tested the slogan of the administration at that time, which was, I forget what it was, we've created 1.6 million jobs. And this woman, in all honesty and perfect innocence, said, yeah, and I've got three of them. Uh, and that's when the president changed his line to, we've created 1.6 million jobs, but that's not good enough. We've got to create good paying jobs you can raise a family on. And so I think that um, it is not a time for victory laps for Democrats. I think it is a time uh, to explain our economic vision. What is our narrative? What are we for? And how to the Democratic base uh, that this, this change we wanted to bring is slow and painful, but we are not quitters. And uh, we need to come out again to make sure we finish the job. Another thing that leaves people confused is uh, the Tea Party. Like, what, mm -hmm. it, what is it? Could you think, yeah. I, 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 I can come back but to that, what but is I, it? Like, I define, I'd be curious to define. said some very important things there, um, mm -hmm. some that I agree with and some that I think, um, you know, the, 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 the liberal base, I mean, first of all, and we, we have something that I think we've done very unique in the battleground poll over the years is we do not ask, are you conservative, moderate, liberal? Mm. We ask, are you conservative or moderate? And then we ask, and they, they volunteer moderate. Uh, we ask, are you conservative or liberal? If they volunteer moderate, we take it. It's never broken 10%. And then we ask, are you very conservative or very liberal to get the ideologues? But the bottom line is you have somewhere in the high 50s of this country saying they are conservative. You have somewhere in the mid 30s saying they are, are, are liberal. And very conservative to very liberal has always been about a two to one ratio. This country is, it's, it's where Bill Clinton had it right. 
this country is center-right in terms of their ideology. Um, so the Democrats' answer to that has been to use the term, and Celinda just used it, I think, four times listening to her talk, the word progressive. Progressive to most voters still mean the same thing. It means moving forward a liberal agenda. Um, uh, and, and they can change the rhetoric all they want. What you have with voters is they are focused on the solutions. And yes, the, I think she's exactly right. I see no signs that the liberal base is disenchanted with the implementation of, of uh, going after the agenda legislatively of that liberal agenda. There is concern beyond that. In fact, if you look internally, some of the lower intensity with the Democrats is because of conservative Democrats mm -hmm. being lower in their intensity. Votes that we weren't going to get anyway in the upcoming election, it still factors in terms of the overall vote. But it, it's not being driven by disenchantment on the left. The only exception to that case would be young voters. And again, young voters, um, uh, in the last presidential election, they were 18% of the votes cast. Year in and year out, in a non-presidential year, they are somewhere between 11 and 12%. So there's a, a, a direct six-point drop-off just because that's the natural nuance of a, of a non-presidential year. Seniors increase, the very group that Solinda says that they're having trouble with, increases by 10% in a non-presidential year. So some of the factors we're looking at here is just natural kind of progression. But what I am seeing with the young voters is that uh, with that group of voters more than any voter group, the Obama campaign allowed himself to be an empty slate with those voters. He also set himself up to be a uh, disenchantment to those younger voters. Yes, there's some progressive, liberal, younger voters in that group. But in large part, they're not. And in large part, they were focused on one key issue coming into the campaign, which was they were against the war. And they heard Obama in their mindset, Obama was going to the president, if he became president, the very next day our troops were going to be home from Afghanistan and Iraq. That was what their mindset was. That was the empty slate that they allowed those voters to develop. And that has been the disappointment. It has been what has happened on the front in terms of the war uh, from their perception of what would happen. And that's where there's some, some dissension amongst the Democrats that have nothing to do with any of the other legislation going on. Now, Tea Party. Just in, in helping define it, I mean, we, we've studied it. We've done countless stories on it. It's, it's because it's not a, a national organization. It's very mm -hmm. tough to define. Uh, we were talking off stage about how people are interpreting uh, what happened up in Delaware. And I, mm -hmm. I think you and I agree that people are, the conventional wisdom is wrong, that, it's pro that people think, oh, this is terrible for Republicans. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to think it's probably good because it shows the energy uh, that the Tea Party movement has, and I think there's a total alignment right now with what, what's driving the Tea Party movement seems to be size of government spending that seems to be from this poll exactly lines up with what the angry, as you mm -hmm. described it, angry independent is. I do think, like more broadly, like people are curious, like what, like what is the Tea Party movement? What should people think of this? How big is it, uh, and how much is this just conservatives with a different name? Uh, it, it, it's deeper than conservatives with a different name. It's very interesting when you look at the the Ross Perot voters back a decade and a half ago. Um, first, first of all, they half of them were young voters, which was never kind of the write up of it, but half of them were young voters. The other half were a group of people that, quite frankly, were small business types, um, uh, everyday people who had gone into business, um, actually weren't very good at it, and blamed everyone else but themselves for not doing well economically. Um, uh, that's not what this group is. This is a much more focused on role of government, too much spending, overreaching, uh, and, and, and basically, every step of the way making it harder and harder and harder for them both to manage themselves personally through the economic concerns that are out there and in terms of long range. Um, they are the very people saying, I am concerned not just about my children's future, not just about my grandchildren's future, but concerned about the country's future. Um, uh, and it's deep. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the 40s. Um, it is largely comprised of Republicans. It is largely comprised of angry independents. But it's a substantial group. I mean, it's nearly 50% of this country. Now, when you talk about it as a movement, one of the things I would point to is it's, it's, it's like any other movement. It's exactly that. And the, the, usually the kiss of death politically for a movement 
is when a leader of that movement becomes bigger than the movement. I mean, if you, if you kind of study history, that's always been the downfall of every movement is when the leader all of a sudden becomes bigger because then you can demonize that leader and bring down the group as a result. Um, in this case, we almost saw the, the, when, the, when they had their convention down in Tennessee, uh, Nashville during the summer, they almost fell apart uh, because in fact, there were several people trying to claim to be leaders of a movement that is leaderless. Um, and I think the future of it will be leaderless. Um, and, and yes, you may have candidates that surface uh, in their support, but that doesn't make them leaders of, of the Tea Party movement. Now you have nuances as you go through states. So Oklahoma, um, uh, there's a very conservative groups that have been in the past identified with John Burr's society. Um, are parts of the Tea Party movement. You go in other parts of the country and it's Ron Paul types. You go in other parts of the country and it's libertarians. Um, but if you look at the bulk of that movement, it is basically an attitude of concern about the future of the country, the spending that this country is doing, and the solutions that this country is using. Um, and and they, are, they are seriously concerned about um, uh, the impact for the future of this country. Now, I think where the news media makes a mistake, I think where campaigns make a mistake, I think where a variety of people make a mistake, is they keep looking for who are the leaders of this movement. And the movement, the attitudes, the concerns are much, much deeper. Um, uh, I have actually, and as opposed to other people in, in my party, um, I'm not concerned about the movement. I don't think they're a negative. Are they something we had to contend with during the primaries? Uh, with candidates, perhaps, that many of us have worked with over the years and preferred? Absolutely. Um, are they as big of a problem for the general election? No. They are now Celinda's problem because <laughs> they are not going to go from where they've been focused to saying, now I'm going to decide between a big spending Democrat and a conservative Republican. I'll take, I'll, I'll take the leaser of two evils. At the very least, that's what they do. If not, in fact, kind of realize that, that, that many of these Republicans, using the re old Reagan adage, are 90% their friend, as opposed to 100% their enemy. Now that the primaries are over, they can focus on that. I want to add a couple of thoughts on the Tea Party. <clears throat> I've said uh, before that I think the Tea Party is like nitroglycerin. And uh, when you're juggling nitroglycerin, sometimes you blow up yourself as well. Um, and I think you've seen some of that during the primaries. Um, I think there are still two challenges that the Tea Party represent uh, for the Republicans. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's solely the Democratic problems. One is, I think you also, um, it's very hard uh, with some of these Tea Party candidates uh, who are really out there uh, to hold together this coalition of independents and Republicans that is critical for, to win in the 2010 elections. And uh, so uh, one of the things you're going to see, I think, is a large number of Tea Party candidates or Tea Party voters uh, going to these third party candidates. There are in a number of these ballots third party candidates, uh, libertarian candidates. In God bless Nevada, they have a block that says none of the above. Um, I think you're going to see some moderate Republicans who feel they don't have a home going over there in Nevada. I think you're going to see in other states uh, some of the Tea Party voters where a more moderate has been nominated going to the Libertarian candidate, and that could be the margin of victory in these close elections. The second thing I think is, um, I think most Democrats cannot wait to uh, buy a beer or a glass of Chablis and watch the Republican caucus try to deal with uh, two or three of these Tea Partiers in the middle of their caucus. I think the governing aspect of this, which hasn't been explored very much, is extraordinarily volatile. And uh, I thought there was a very interesting story uh, um, this morning on NPR where they had the head of the Waco Tea Party who said, no, 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 we're not social conservatives, we're just interested in spending. And the head of the Mississippi Tea Party which said, well, the First Amendment, and actually this was a reinterpretation of the Constitution, is, uh, <laughs> says that uh, we have to protect life. And I thought, great. This is our future. We can't wait for it. The other thing that comes with the tide, and I would go even beyond governing in six years uh, or, or immediately, the thing that always comes with that tide is having to face a class of people that may have been right for that, but six years later mm -hmm. become a problem. 
Um, So I can see, uh, quite frankly, in the environment where many of these people we're talking about as not being viable end up winning on Election Day. I think there are going to be some surprises in the Senate. But I also think it's going to be a problem not for the next year or two years. It's going to be a problem six years down the road. We have time for one question from the audience. Right there. Thank you. Um, I guess I just have one question. Would be, uh, do you honestly think it's possible for this to go down with the wind? Um, the question is, uh, I'm not sure if the transcript can get it, but the question is, can, is it possible for O'Donnell to win in Delaware? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's also possible for, uh, you know, uh, uh, the economy to turn around in a month, too, but I don't think it's very likely to happen. Yes. <laughs> First of all, I think Harry Reid does not win. I've not seen a survey yet that he has broken 44, 45% in terms of the surveys. I know there's a survey out coming out either yesterday or today that shows him uh, down a couple of points or down a point or two. With value about, he needs 43. That's right. He only needs 43. That's assuming that people ultimately are going to go and vote there. I think ultimately they don't. Um, and that's, not, that's been kind of the history of Nevada. There's always a lot of talk about that, but that's not where they end up. Uh, your, your other question, though, in terms of Tea, tea Party, party. Right. Um, you know, again, I think it is a, 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 a movement that has ca- been caused over the concern about the direction of the country and about the solutions being implemented uh, in this country. Uh, that gets turned around, um, then I think you will see them uh, focus in other areas. However, um, I think, again, that's my biggest concern with the Tea Party is what are the expectations, yeah. real expectations in terms of understanding how things happen in Washington. If they want things turned around, they need to be there for the presidential campaign in two years, not here for this election. Tea and Party for hope and change. Is there that you the go. Message? If I can just say one thing, I would be remiss to say, I think Harry Reid will win. And I think that the, uh, they've won a spectacular campaign, but the person that will defeat Sharon Engel is Sharon Engel. Uh, in her own words. And I think it's not just the none of the above, which I think you'll see at record high performance levels, but there are a slew of independent candidates there as well. And I think each of those is going to pull one or two points, and that's straight out of Sharon. So, uh, you know, I think it, I agree with that. It depends a lot on uh, what happens in terms of the economy, in terms of these solutions, who's in control. Uh, but I will say this that uh, I think they're much uh, less likely, and, and who also, it represents a real challenge, which is a story for the next battleground survey, um, who the Republicans nominate in their primary. Uh, is, it makes it very, very challenging for the Republican presidential primary, I think. So we, uh, despite our collegiality up here, end with a sharp disagreement on the future of Harry <laughs> Reid. I'm going to <laughs> turn it go. back over to Mike Friedman. Sharp and collegial. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me first, uh, on behalf of everybody here, thank our participants for an extraordinary discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very much. We want to thank all of you for joining us today, spending part of your morning with us. We hope you'll have time now to join us up on the second floor if you want to continue some of these discussions. Um, We have a nice reception set up for everybody on the second level of the media building. We hope to see you all again later this month for the results of the second of the three polls that uh, will be conducted before the November elections. Thank you all very much for joining us.